Our speaker now is Javier Bonaventura, and Javier is a software engineer at BMW, where he works on the software stack for the next generation of autonomous driving, including the coordination between the software quality and the software development team. He believes that success in large-scale projects can only be achieved with high-quality standards, modern technology and applying software engineering principles at all levels. His areas of expertise are computer graphics, information theory and also data aggregation with code bases of different sizes with contributions from five to two thousand software developers. He loves learning and teaching and when he's not programming he likes cooking, hiking and jogging. Javier, over to you. Hello to everyone. Uh, my name is Xavier Bonaventura. I'm from the BMW group and today I'm here to give you an introduction to Bazel to build uh, C++ and, and Python. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a software developer at the BMW since 2018 and I'm working at the Department of Full Autonomous Driving. I've been working with Bazel for around two years uh, since I started BMW and mainly I work on C++ and Python, that's programming languages. Let's start first about Bazel. Uh, what is Bazel? Bazel is a build system, it's not a build generator, uh, like could be CMake for example, it invokes directly the compiler. Uh, it provides full functionality for testing, it can give you test reports, it handles uh, flaky tests uh, and a lot of other functionalities. And mainly it's written in Java, uh, some small parts in C++, and then has uh, some uh, rules and macros that can be written to extend Bazel that these are written in Starlar. Uh, for the history, uh, we need to first go back to Blaze. Blaze is the build system at Google. Uh, development started around 2007, and part of Blaze was open source on 2015 with the name of Bazel. Uh, and it moved from beta to general availability uh, more or less one year ago uh, on October 2019. The release process that it follows, it's, uh, since it's general availability, it follows semantic versioning and there's, they skip a time span of minimum three months between major releases and they pr provide a minor release every month based on GitHub help. This was until now, but uh, now in next month, so starting with Bazel 4, uh, they provide long-term support, similar to what we can find in Ubuntu, and there will be major releases every nine months. And in this long-term support, they will be provide uh, uh, support for around two years. Let's go a bit over the, the Bazel features. Uh, Bas the main feature for Bazel is fast and correct and basically this allows incremental builds, test execution, also incremental uh, test. Uh, it provides parallel execution, it provides a local and remote cache and basically it also has hermetic builds uh, thanks to sandboxing. It's a multi-language and multi-platform. It supports uh, a lot of different languages, Java, C, C++, Android, iOS, and the ones that are not supported can be uh, perfectly added. It runs in multiple platforms, Linux, Windows, Mac OS, and uh, it can also run in some other uh, platforms that are not officially supported, but it can be compiled because it's just uh, Java. Uh, it's a scalable. Uh, it's intended to handle code bases of any size. This is coming from Google. They have a huge monorepo and it can handle smaller repos, but it can also handle multiple repositories. It's extensible and to extend it, uh, you can add a platform, you can add a language if it's not supported. Uh, and basically it uses this Skylark language that is similar to Python. Okay, now what's, what's Bazel in a nutshell? Uh, it's an artifact-based system and 
we have inputs, we have actions, and we have outputs. The inputs are treated as artifacts, the outputs are treated as artifacts, and the actions are treated as artifacts as well. And for every artifact, we can compute the hash in advance. With this way, we can use caching. Uh, thanks to the we, we search on the cache with this hash, and if it's available, then we don't need to uh, build the artifact. Uh, each action runs on a sandbox. Uh, with this way, it improves reproducibility, and you can better detect if you have some dependencies and declare, and you don't have the issue that you are pulling in the dependencies when they were not even declared. It's composable also. It means that the outputs of an action can be used as inputs of another action, and an action can be the output of another uh, action. Okay, uh, let's let's go a bit on the the design to understand uh, also a little bit how this speed comes from. Basel follows a, a client server architecture design. We have a Bazel server and we have Bazel client. And the first time that the Bazel command is executed, a server is started on the same machine. After the Bazel command finishes, the server keeps running on the background for a certain amount of time. And then the following command that is executed use this already running server. Uh, there's one small thing, two clients they cannot run in parallel. But basically, the advantage is that, uh, that uh, this architecture allows the server uh, to cache information between uh, commands execution. And the Bazel server can be stopped with uh, Bazel shutdown if, if you want after running the command. Then the basic uh, files from Bazel, we have mainly three types of files. The first one would be the workspace. This file is unique. It's at the root of the source code that you want to build. And it can be empty. And it's used to declare external dependencies mainly. And where this workspace, uh, the folder where this workspace is located, it would be our repository. Then we have the build files. These are the files where we will define the, the targets. It's at the root of a package. And a package is defined by all files, folders, and subfolders at the same le level like the build file, except the, these folders that already contain a build file. And with this way, you can have, uh, like you see on the right, the, this package and subpackage structure. And then in addition, we said that uh, Bazel is extensible. And basically, we have these uh, BZL files that are used to define Bazel extensions, and they can be loaded in a build or in the workspace file using a, a load statement. Uh, to reference to all of these packages and targets, uh, Bazel use labels, and a uh, label in Bazel looks similar to, to this that you are seeing. There's a add, repository name, and then you put the folder subfolder, until the build file and then colon and then the target name inside the build file. You can omit part of this uh, label. If you omit the repository, it assumes that you are in the current repository. You can also omit the part after the colon and then it will assume that your target name is called like the folder that contains the build file. And in case that you are inside the same build file, you can omit everything in front of the colon to reference to a target inside the, the same build file. Let's see now uh, an example for the Bazel labels. Here we have this uh, client server. And now let's imagine that in this client, uh, we have the build file and we define two libraries, small client and a client. Basically, we could reference to this small client target with at example, that is the name of our repository, dash dash client. This is the folder where we have the, the build uh, file where the target is defined. 
and then colon, and then the name of the target that is mob client. In this case, we could omit example, and this would still be okay. And then uh, for the other target for client, we have the same option, but in this case, because the target is exactly named like the folder that contains the build file, you can also omit everything that comes uh, after the colon. And in case that you are in the same build file, this build file inside client, you could reference to client and small client, just colon and name of the target. Okay, uh, another concept that we have in Bazel, it's target visibility. And basically when we, we define a target, we can also define who can see this target. And this will do it with this uh, parameter called visibility. This will be a list following similar to the uh, Python style for defining list. And basically we have several values that we can put there. Uh, one would be uh, slash slash visibility private. This to indicate that this it's only visible inside the same build file. No one outside can see this target. We can also define that the target is public, just same principle, but ending it with public, and then anyone can see this target. For these two cases, you are not allowed to uh, define multiple visibilities uh, in the list if you use private or public. Then in addition, we can also say that the target is visible by a specific package or an, an all of its subs packages. And basically what you do, you follow the similar like for the labels that we saw before, but instead of putting the name of the target, you just stop at the build file and you say sub packages. And then you can also say that it's only visible for a specific package, but not the sub packages. And this you can do it with double underscore package. The visibility can be defined per package, per target or both. If we don't define it uh, per target, it's by default is the same like the package. And if it's also not defined, then it's basically private and it's only visible within the build file. And this is most of the targets, how most of the time will be. Now let's move to the phases of a build in Bazel. Bazel is the structure in, in three phases. We have one that is the loading phase. In this loading phase, it's, it's the part of loading the files, loading the extensions. It's more like the physical process of of loading the file system and that is relevant for, for your build. This is a phase that takes several seconds the first time and then uh, can be cached. We have the second phase that is the analysis phase and now here we have everything loaded but now we start doing some semantic analysis of its rule. We build a dependency graph, we make see that everything is correct and we analyze also that uh, what work needs to be done. This is also a, a phase that it's quite fast and also uh, can be cached. And then finally we have the execution phase where the targets are built, compilation, linking, you execute targets, you run tests and this is where you will spend most of the time. But also part of this can be uh, speed up thanks also to caching. Okay, we talk a lot about Bazel cache. Let's now see the different levels of cache that we have in Bazel. And we could say that we have four different levels of cache. The first one would be in memory cache. It's this Bazel server that we saw, this cache that goes across uh, Bazel execution, and it's clean or lost every time that the server is stopped. We have output directory. This uh, Bazel out is a directory that will be created at the same level, level like the workspace file. It's local to the workspace. And you can also uh, remove it with Bazel clean or Bazel clean expunge. 
Then we have the discash. This is a folder in the local machine. It's useful to share artifacts uh, when you switch branches. If you have uh, your repository, check out multiple times in the same machine. And what, the only thing that can happen is that it can grow quite a lot. And one recommendation is just to clean it from time to time. Then in addition, uh, Bazel provides some uh, protocol for remote caching. And basically you can enable remote cache. Uh, it's nothing else than an HTTP server. And it's useful to, to share artifacts between team members or with the CI that if someone else already built it, you, you don't have to build it. Uh, Basal cache is always valid and correct and you should not clean it. In general, you should never clean it. The only reason why you should clean it is to get some free space. Uh, if at some point you solve a problem doing a Basal clean, a bad ticket should be created. This is an issue. It's Something went wrong. It might be on the Basal core, it might be on, on some of the Basal rules, or it might be in one of your toolchain configurations or yeah, some of the Bazel extensions that you created. If these are from the Bazel core or the Bazel rules, usually these bugs are taken uh, quite seriously uh, because it's, it's something that is the fundamentals of Bazel that we have a proper cache mechanism. Uh, Bazel uh, a local cache setup could look something like that. We have the several workspaces checked out. In each workspace, you have this uh, Bazel out folder. And then in addition, you have some folder inside that is this, uh, this cache that you can share between workspaces. When we see this in a higher level, we can see like with remote cache, uh, one, this is one of the setups recommended by Bazel. We have the different machines that are reading from the remote cache and we have one CI machine that is reading and writing to the remote cache. Uh, the reason is why you have only one machine writing to the cache is to have a little bit more control. Usually the CI machine, you have quite control on, to, on, on it, but on the developer's machine, it could be that you have uh, not so much control, maybe some some of the parts are not hermetic and you could corrupt the cache. With this way, you just leave it to only one machine right into the cache. You could go to a more distributed approach. You could have several remote caches because if you have one single remote cache, you will start having problems of bottleneck to access to retrite the cache. Uh, and basically you will start needing to do some balancing or replication and then the other option that you have is just you can create several remote caches and then you can have some let's call it cache heater that is a single machine that takes care of warming up uh, this cache uh, another feature that we set is like uh, it's remote execution it's like because we said that uh, the idea of Bazel is that it's also very fast and how to make this fast is through remote execution uh, Bazel compilation and, and execution, um, execution can run in different machines. We would have the, the most simple scenario that Bazel executes on one machine, code compiles also on the same machine and it's executed in the same machine. Then we have a second scenario that it, the execution, the compilation happens in a single machine and then the code execution ha happens in separate machines. And then we could have the third scenario that we have compilation in different machines, execution in different machines, and we have basal execution in a machine that the only thing that it does is just orchestrating all of this. And you could be compiling your code in data centers, executing the test in data centers, and with this way speed up uh, really a lot. Okay, now let's uh, see an example of uh, Bazel for C++ and Python. We said that uh, Bazel is extensible. Bazel supports multiple languages. We already saw a little bit how it looks, the library, but let's go deep into that. Uh, the first thing that we have to do if we want to uh, do the use C++, 
we need to load the C++ rules. We have binaries, libraries and tests. These are the three types of rules that uh, each language uh, implements. And then we have the same for Python. And then we will have three, the three most basic commands would be basal run to run a binary and then build for building and test for testing. Uh, straightforward names. And when you run these commands, you can always uh, use wildcards. If you use wildcards, basically you are building or testing all the targets that are under these uh, wildcards. Okay, but we set a build system for Python. Why? I mean, Python is not compiled. I mean, why would you need it? We C++ is a compiled language, okay, it's normal, we need a build system. But Python, Python is an interpreter language. Why would we want to use a, a build system? Well, if you use a, a build system that to control through your dependencies, then it's more difficult to leak dependencies uh, with the sandboxing. You have a, a, a unified way in Bazel to, to run your targets across languages. You saw Bazel build, Bazel uh, test, you don't care which language is being run and you have the benefit of a lot of Bazel test utilities that Bazel provides that we will see uh, later on. And of course, like for Python, you doesn't make sense to build something, but still you need all the rest. Let's see how it looks a, a C++ example. Uh, we defined here, uh, we called the load, loading the binary and the library. And then we define this CC binary and we have this parameter name. This is then this it's common to all the targets and here it's to specify the target name. Then we have the sources that these are the files needed to build your binary. And then you have the dependencies to say on what you are depending on. Here you would define your libraries. For a CC library, we have a similar approach, name for the target. And then here, the sources and the headers. The sources would be everything, all, trans all translation units of the library and the private headers. And then in headers, you would put only the public headers. With this way, you can keep a clear separation between public and private headers. And then to run this hello world example, you would just call basal run and the label of the target, if it's in the root, dash, dash, uh, colon, hello world. In case that you want to build it, you do basal build and hello world. In this case, would also take care of building the library because it's needed to build the hello world. And if you just want to build the library, then Bazel build and the library. Uh, we have also these uh, targets for testing. This would be a CC test. And basically you have the sources also, that is the sources of your test, and then you have the dependencies. And for the dependencies, it's the same. You say on which libraries you depend. When you run it, you would call basal test and the target, and then you would see a summary of uh, the test, if it passed or not. Now let's see on, on Python. On Python, it, it looks very similar to what we just saw. You load the Python rules uh, with uh, the statement similar like before. And then here we can define our pi binary and pi library. And it's important here the differentiation between binary and library because a binary can be executed and a library cannot be executed. But it's the same. Then we can run Bazel bin, uh, Bazel run and the binary, Bazel build. And in this case, it will happen nothing. It's Python. It will tell you nothing to build. And if you would try to base to run the, the, the library, it would tell you that this is not an executable. And indeed, you, you would get the same message if you would do it in, in C++. For a test, as you see, it would look 
more or less the same. And this would be go and go on with all the different languages. Uh, most of the rules, they follow this convention that you just put the language underscore library, language underscore test or underscore binary, and you run them with this command. And here's where you see that it's quite handy that it's a unified way for all the languages. You don't care in which language you are programming and if you have mixed languages. Okay, now let's see uh, how Bazel would help us or like who, how we would do it in Bazel if we would want to combine Python and C++. Um, Bazel, as we said, can be extended and can be extended in two ways, in macros or with rules. And uh, we have a, an example that we have an input a txt file, we would have a, a Python executable that basically converts this txt file in a generated CPP and then we want to uh, compile the CPP and get an executable. Basically what we will be doing is a kind of a customized auto-generated hello world. You give an input txt and will generate a hello world with this string, compile it, run it, and you will get a different output depends on the input that you provide. Okay, to do that, let's see which parts we need to do. Uh, first, we need to define this generator. The generator, uh, in this case, we want to do it in Python. Then basically we have a Python program that it takes a file uh, path as an input, another file path as an output. And basically what it does is to generate a, a CPP file that contains a hello world. That it, uh, it says hello and the message is the one that comes from the input file. Uh, this generator we define it also in in Bazel, like we saw that we define a new pi binary, we put the name, we put the sources, and we can set here the visibility flag to public because this will need to be visible. Okay, now uh, we have the generator, now we can put a, a macro uh, around it. And Bazel, uh, there are this, some of the, there is some native rules. And one of the native rules is this gen rule. And basically now what we do is we define a macro that is called hello world. And you just give a, a name, a target name. And basically what we'll do, it will instantiate this target gen rule that the name will be the same name that you specified. And then as the sources will be na the name that you put .txt the output will be this name.cpp and here you can pass the command uh, that will be executed. And here you use this location to indicate wherever that is and you can put the, the, the label of the target. And then you have this special syntax with the dollars that basically it expands to the sources and to the outputs. And here you have this uh, parameter tools that basically it's to say kind of like your tool dependencies, like which, which tool is needed to run this rule. And we are referencing the generator that we saw before. And here we uh, put the visibility that depends on how it was passed. And then now the only part missing would be to invoke these macros. On a build file, we would load uh, the the macro that we define this hello world and then you can just define it like that hello world you put the name in this case yeah code dive and one that it's called everyone and if we remember how we define the macro this will search for code dive.txt when you try to run it and everyone.txt we generate a cpp and then if we see we define this cc binary that what it takes is as a source is uh, this hello world code dive and this is the 
the source will expand to this generated file. And then basically we can run it and we'll get the strings that we just saw. Okay, but let's wait a second. We said that if it's basically it's hermetic, everything is so hermetic, but now the question comes, why we did not have to specify our compiler? Uh, well, the, for practical reasons, Bazel provides some predefined toolchains. A toolchain is nothing else than the definition of all of your tools that be, need to be used for your language. In C++ would be the compiler, compiler options, the linker, etc. In Python, you could have the Python interpreter, uh, the Python standard library, etc. Uh, and Bazel provides uh, some predefined toolchains and if the text that you have some compilers, they can be used automatically. Uh, when you run a Bazel command, you can use this toolchain resolution debug and you can see which toolchain has been uh, selected. Uh, still, if you use Bazel for any production project, you should be defining an her hermetic toolchain. Uh, defining a toolchain is not enough because you could define a toolchain that points to some local uh, compiler installed. But this can bring to one person is using a version, another person is using another one. And basically compilers and linkers should be provided like an input artifact. This should be checked in, which is why everyone is using the same compiler. And the Python interpreter the same should be an input artifact, which is why everyone uses the same Python version, independent on what you have installed on your machine. As a general rule, if a user needs to install something in his machine apart from Bazel, then you are doing something wrong. And you should revisit that. Bazel provides a lot of documentation on how to define toolchains, and you have also some tutorials that you can check. Okay, one thing that we said that's quite uh, important on Bazel is the test runner, the, the whole test execution engine. Uh, we need to remind that all testing infrastructure provided by Bazel is language agnostic. And when you are using uh, the Bazel test, it's dash dash dot dot dot, it will run all rules that are of type test. It doesn't matter if they are C++, Python, Go, any other languages. It will run all the tests and accept that you define, you can define also in the rules, you can define a, a parameter called tag. And if you put manual, then it's a kind of deactivate the test or say, hey, this test needs to be explicitly run and they will be ignored if you run it with the wildcards. The ones with uh, flaky flag set to true, you also have this parameter flaky that you can set to true. This to indicate that the test is flaky and Bazel will take care of running it automatically, uh, again, in case that it would fail. Because consider that it's flaky, let's run it again. It will run it three times to make sure, to make sure that if it's really failing or was just flaky. Test also can time out if a test uh, takes too much, too, too long to execute. Then you have also two parameters that you can play with, timeout and size. And depends on this combination, this will decide a, a timeout. And if the test takes too long, then it will just be uh, stopped and failed with a timeout message. As we said, tests will run in parallel. But you have also the option in tags to specify a tag that's called exclusive. And what does it mean is that for whatever reason that you have in your test, this test should not be executed with, together with any other test. This is something that you should avoid because if you start using it, then yeah, you lose the whole parallelization. Uh, the output of the test is always stored to a, a file but it will also be displayed to a console in case that a test fails. 
uh, the output can be shown interactively uh, if you specify test output stream then you will see it, uh, the, the output at the same time that the test is being executed but you need to keep in mind that if you run if you pass this option then the test doesn't run in parallel this is something that you can do it if you are debugging some specific test uh, which is why you don't have to go all the time and check the log. Uh, also, in addition, uh, one thing that Bazel provides is that for every target you can set a parameter that it's called test only. And if you set it, it means that this library can only be used by test only targets, meaning test or other uh, libraries that are marked as test only. With this way, what you are avoiding is that accidentally some testing library end up in your target, because as soon as you try to have a, a normal binary depend on a test only library, then Bazel will complain and will just fail. And if a test uh, or its dependencies did not change, basically it's like there's no reason to run a test if nothing changes. You, you run it once, you know that it passed, you don't change anything, you run it again, hey, it should pass. Uh, then basically in this case, Bazel will cache the result of the test and will not run the test. But when, you, when it displays the summary, you will see that it's being cached. You also have an option uh, to use to force Bazel to rerun it. And in the end, uh, after running all the tests, independent of the languages, you will have a list with all the execution, like you see here on the screen. And basically it can show you like different possibilities. Uh, here we have, I think we have, I, I didn't forget any. We have a, a test that passed, but it was cached, some that are passed, flaky, failed. If the test fails to build, uh, for example, in case of C++, you would also see it here, or if it time out. And in the terms that when they are failing, uh, here they are uh, printing you the, the log path, and you can go there and just check what was the issue. And in most of the IDs, you can just control click to the, to the link and it will open the log file. Okay, uh, Bazel provides also another command that is called Bazel coverage. And basically it's intended for uh, computing the code coverage. It's relatively straightforward to run. It just pays all coverage and the name of the test that you want to run and calculate the coverage. Or you can also use wildcards here and run a lot of tests and measure the coverage for all the tests. And yeah, all of these will collect the information, will generate uh, uh, that file in case of GCC and then afterwards you can run for example gen, gen X, HTML and you can have a report. Um, the issue here is that unfortunately Bazel, the, the code coverage in Bazel is not really complete at the moment and for example if we have here on the screen this example that we have two libraries, foo and bar, and main depends on both of them. This main file, uh, main uh, binary is the one that you want to deploy, it's your production main file. Then you have uh, some test targets like this foo test. If you would run this all your tests, you would create the code coverage report, and here you would get 80% uh, code coverage. And you would see that only the only file that appears is the foo.cp that is part of the foo library. The problem here is that you don't see anywhere in this coverage report uh, your bar uh, library mentioned or your main binary mentioned here. And this is because to do that you would have to compute the, the baseline coverage. And the moment that you build the, the main, you would have to calculate uh, this, this coverage. But this is not supported out of the box and yeah, there are some issues for that. 
Another uh, cool functionality that Bezel provides that this helps you a lot to get a lot of insight on what's going on is Bezel Query. Uh, it provides there are three commands uh, and this helps you to understand the build graph. Uh, these are Bezel Query, C Query, and A Query. Uh, the first two are uh, for checking the, the going over the build graph and checking the dependencies and they query it's mainly for introspecting the actions that uh, we saw before. The main difference between query and cQuery is that query is running after the loading phase and cQuery is running after uh, the analysis phase. And basically, cQuery considers some configuration flags. But yeah, if you want to know more, there's also the link for the query, and you can check more there. But basically, how it would work? Let's imagine here this uh, dependency graph that we have on the right, like we saw before. And here you would say Bazel query depths, and uh, this to say dependencies of this target foot test. And then you say, okay, I don't. You have these two parameters: no tool depths, no implicit depths. That is to say, yeah, I don't want the dependencies that are from tooling like compilers, or implicit dependencies from from some rules. And basically, what would tells you it's like a full list of everything that footest depends on. Okay, this catch uh, library, footest cpp dot age, etc. This general will be quite a, a huge list, but then if you see some strange dependency here that you don't know where it's coming from, then you also have uh, uh, some uh, functionality that's some path. For example, here, I want to know how foot test depends on foot dot edge, why this dependency. And basically, when you do basal query some path between foot test and foot dot edge, it will tell you. Well, full, dot, full test depends on full library, and full library depends on full dot edge. And here is you can see your dependency path. If you do it for um, another, for example, here, how full test depends on bar, in case that you would not have any path, it would just give you this info empty results. There are no dependencies. And this could also be used if you want to make sure that some, uh, some library does never end up in your production or stuff like that. Okay, uh, we saw that uh, Bazel is just not uh, just building, it comes with a lot of uh, functionalities and tooling. And one of the toolings that is provided also is Bazelisk. Bazelisk is, is really quite handy. It's nothing else than a, a Bazel launcher. But uh, why it's so useful? It allows to use multiple Bazel versions in one machine or in one workspace. You don't have to care about installing it, uh, different versions of Bazel. You just use Bazelisk. And basically, the developer doesn't need to care about upgrading Bazel uh, because Bazelisk will take the latest one, let's see, how, how can be used. You have several ways. One way would be you can define an environment variable called use Bazel version and you specify the, the version that wants to be used. And then you can also have a Bazel RC a file checked in in your repository next to your workspace file. And you put there the, the version of Bazel that should be used. Or if you don't define any of this, basically, uh, basically is what we'll do is we'll just grab the latest Bazel release. And with this way, the developers, they don't have to care which Bazel version is used in your project. And it can be run like Bazel. You just do Bazel is run, hello world, for example. You can pass all the parameters the same like Bazel, it's just forwarding them. You can also put it uh, into your binary path, rename like Bazel, which is why you just, you just can call Bazel run, but in reality it's running Bazelisk. And Bazelisk will take care of before running, checking the Bazel version, downloading the Bazel version that you need, 
and running that basal version. And you don't have to care anymore about versioning. Uh, in addition, one of the functionalities that provides Basilisk is uh, for migration. When you want to uh, update your code to a newer Bazel version, Bazel they provide uh, incompatibility flags. It's a way that you can test in advance if your code will be okay in a newer version. And basically you can and run Basilisk with strict or migrate and this will check with these incompatible flags and this can help on, on the migration process. Then uh, another topic that I just wanted to open uh, is to have some ideas for the future. Basically Basil provides also aspects. Aspects is uh, something that allows you, once you have a, a dependency graph, it allows to augment this dependency graph with additional information. You can have on all of your targets some additional information that it's customized, that you decided what it is. And the question here would be for, for what could be used. And indeed, uh, it can be used for quite a lot of stuff, and I'm, I'm willing to see more. Uh, one of the main ones is for ID integration. You have uh, Bazel integration in Visual Studio Code. Uh, you have it also on C-Lion uh, and in some others, I think. And basically this is done thanks to these uh, aspects. You can also use aspects to, to do static analysis, to store static analysis results per target. You could also use it for code coverage, some people are using it. Uh, compiler warnings, it's just another level of extensibility that provides that it's, you can just kind of build a, a parallel dependency graph that it's uh, binded to the original one and here just you can just run your imagination and, and decide. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, let's check a bit the, the last, uh, the, the commands. Uh, we saw some of the main commands. Uh, we, will, we still have some basal help that you can run it with uh, basal help and the specific command if you have, it's really complete, I, I really recommend it. You have also some verbose versions. Uh, you have basal version that is getting especially important if you are using Basilisk because you never know which one you are using. With this way you can always call basal version and you will check and then if you want to check documentation the first thing that you should do is to run basal version. You have uh, basal build. Uh, that uh, that is what we saw before, and maybe the the key functionality here is that you can you can run only the loading and analysis phase, and this can help you to keep your uh, graph correct all the time. Basal run, we already saw it also. Basal test, also so the coverage, as we said, really not not a lot of support for a lot of languages hopefully we'll get better and then we have the the three commands that we set for for querying and the basal clean that yeah remember that if you have to run it there's there's some bugs somewhere i also added here some references there's a talk from lukas and Julio at CBBcast uh, talking about Bazel, it's uh, really interesting. Uh, if you want to know more about uh, also on what we are doing on the BMW group and how we migrated to, to Bazel, uh, Patrick and Axel were giving a, a nice talk on the BazelCon last year. And then if you are interested on, on Bazel coverage, uh, even though unfortunately it's not so well supported, I strongly recommend this talk from, from Elina Yanku to really understand 
all the consoles be, be inside uh, uh, coverage. And yeah, basically, that's all. Uh, I hope that you like it. Uh, if you want to start with Bazel right away, what what should you do? What would be the recommendation? The first thing is that probably like next month will come Basel 4 in a long-term support. I think it's a nice uh, place to start uh, with a kind of a stable version. Then uh, check the Basel page. The documentation is very complete there. You have examples. And if you move to Basel or not, Basically, the main point here would be, do you plan to end up with more than one language in your repository? And if that's the case, then yeah, it's, it's quite worth it. If you are on Windows, I think, unfortunately, that the Windows support for Basel is not so nice like we would like, but it's going there. But yeah, just give it a try try with some small examples and then you can evaluate. Uh, there are a lot of things that they have reported uh, speed ups uh, like 10 times faster and the thing is that also we saw a lot of times that it's really correct that very rare there are rarely times that you need to run a basal clean because something didn't work. I hope you enjoyed and if you have any questions uh, just write them down or just ask them right away or just contact me later. Thanks a lot. Javier Bonaventura on C++ and Python. Thank you very much indeed.